Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Facebook Live. I have uh, another guest on that happens to be another good friend from way back, just uh, <laughs> like Pete Cervoni, uh, about the same time, about 20 years ago so <laughs> or so. <laughs> we connected, and a lot's uh, been going on since then, uh, both in the plant-based movement and, um, and, and for both of our lives have changed pretty dramatically over that time, and uh, including uh, Jill having a child, a seven-year-old <laughs> vegan since birth. Uh, welcome, Jill. Nice to have Hi, you. Hi, how are you? Nice to be here. <laughs> so, you know, I don't think I've ever heard your origin story for going plant-based vegan. Oh gosh, I don't really think there is one. I, uh, I've, I've heard so many great stories and, you know, uh, people having these kind of um, just watershed moments and, you know, the kind of light switch goes off. Um, I always say that I just kind of, you know, I have a lot of memories as a child of not liking uh, certain foods and um, they were uh, it took me a long time to realize they were all animal foods, um, you know, even including things like ice cream, which I wasn't, I wasn't really keen on. Um, and, uh, and so it took a long time um, for me to kind of be able to articulate that. Um, the Smiths helped with their Meat is Murder album, kind of started to, um, to make sense. And then um, uh, went vegetarian, I think about age 13 or so and and that didn't really stick um and then uh a few years later stopped eating meat again and and that stuck but you know back then it was vegan was really unheard of so um and so i ate dairy a little bit you know for a few more years but i didn't i didn't really like it i was like what why am i eating this i, I don't like it uh and um i i have I can't remember the exact day, but I have one really strong memory where I was eating like a cheese pizza and um, it was just not, it was not enjoyable. So I stopped. Mm -hmm. And then I became fully uh, aware of uh, animal rights issues. You know, I think about that time, like PETA was really um, mm -hmm. uh, gaining a lot of attention, mainstream media attention. And that kind of opened my eyes to a lot of the animal rights issues. Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, kind of come into it uh, more so a long time ago, back you know, like in 1980s when I turned, and, and early on, and when you turned uh, too as well. It was more of an intuitive thing. It was more an internal process. Now, yeah. fortunately, there's so much information, whether it be on the science side, to the the movies and books, and and obviously social media has played a huge part in this. And as your career moved along, when did you actually start gravitating to aligning your your um, food choices with your workplace? I know that took a while for me to get uh, to finally get that aligned, but uh, I'm so glad I did. And mm -hmm. you ended up with a very successful career in um, working for some some pretty amazing companies, which we'll talk about. Yeah, uh, you know, I think for me, the um, it was uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And um, because I, um, you know, really kind of knew that I wasn't, I wasn't going to be eating this food anymore. Um, and there weren't that many options. Uh, you could not walk into a Burger King and get a <laughs> uh, impossible Whopper or anything. Um, I ended up I was in Western Pennsylvania. And uh, so there was, you know, it was not a progressive place, uh, not super progressive like LA or, you know, anything on the coasts. And um, so I ended up at a, like a health food co-op and I had been helping a, a woman who was doing like a little bit of catering in my hometown. Um, she was bringing uh, vegetarian food to um, a local university campus every day. And so I was working with her and got involved with this co-op. Um, uh, pretty early on, kind of, you know, young and needed work. And that, um, aside from like a four year gap where I was a, a bicycle messenger in, in the city, um, the rest of it has all really been in this field. I, I you know, worked the health food store um, circuit for a while. Not circuit, I mean, there were only like two in my hometown, but um, did a lot of that work and then um, ended up. Uh, 
getting kind of recruited by the brokerage company, which is how I met you. And so I uh, moved to Miami and then from there worked with a, a few more brands in the space and, but always loved writing and content. So um, uh, finally was able to, uh, to bring those two worlds together about a decade ago. And with Live Kindly, I think uh, you really made some uh, major impact producing over 10,000 uh, articles <laughs> and videos. That's incredible. Thank you. And, and, and putting forth some of that, I'm sure some of the pieces that you did had greater impact or more engagement. What were some of the pieces that you felt really inspired a lot of response from people, um, got a lot of reaction? Yeah, we did. Um article on a, a video that was put out a couple years ago it was kind of like a, like a little commercial um takes place in a restaurant and i think it's like the northwest and um the guests order some kind of like ribs or something and um they're escorted into a like a garage with a pig where they and a mm. knife and you know um uh, they're told that if you want to eat this animal you have to kill it yourself and um, uh, obviously it was you know, put out by an animal rights organization. And um, we covered that and it, it went incredibly viral. And I, I think the title had a lot to do with that. I think it was something along the lines of like this short video will turn you vegan in two minutes or something. And uh, I, I was always really surprised and I'm, and I'm still surprised at, um, at how much the animal rights stories uh, get a response. And you know, in this space, there's a lot of talk about like, oh, you know, you need to have mainstream content and these mainstream products. And, and I think that's true. You know, you want to reach a wide audience, but I think uh, people just aren't given the credit that they really deserve. I think they're much more open-minded when it comes to talking about animal sentience and, and the principles of compassion and, um, you know, the reason to, um, to avoid these practices, whether it's in food or uh, medical science or clothing, you know, what zoos, entertainment. And so a, a lot of the stories that did really well for us um, at the time were, were animal rights, you know, anything SeaWorld usually does really well. Um, we did one on um, kind of a tongue in cheek one, like 10 reasons not to go vegan. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and that that has uh, was a, a top performer for a really long time. Yeah, it's amazing it, to me, and it's kind of an unfortunate situation that we're in that we've created the convenient distance from the actual killing of the animal, and uh, in, in the in the in our food consumption process. And if people did actually have to go back to uh, killing the animal uh, in order to to eat it and, and cleaning it and stuff like that, I think there would be a very big different response from people in, in choosing that. I mean, pick up an apple and you can just start chewing on it right away. Having to go out and and, and take a knife to an animal and end its life is is just quite a different experience, you know. Um, yeah. I, I know some people say, well, that's guilting or shaming, and it's not. It's it's how animal uh, agriculture began in its early phases. That's how all humans ate animals, is they killed it themselves. They raised it on their own farm and they killed it themselves. So it's, it's only in our modern society that if you actually present that to someone, they think it's extreme and it's it's not. That's, that's, the, <laughs> that's the whole way the food process began. What yeah, I, scenario? I explained it to my daughter, you know, who uh, just turned seven and has been vegan her whole life and uh, has a lot of questions as a lot of her friends aren't vegan. And we talk a lot about how, um, you know, it's something that that we historically did because we didn't have options. You know, we we lived we lived outside. We ate outside. Everything was um <laughs> completely foreign to the way most of us live our lives now. Um, there were no Barbie dream houses, I tell her, you know. Um, and, and now we have that luxury and we figured out how to you know, build houses and computers and all of these things and the argument that like, um, you know, somehow we need to be killing animals. They've, you know, they've always been part of our diet is, uh, is, is kind of unfortunate. And I've heard, uh, 
others like Ethan Brown talks about how uh, and he's the founder of Beyond Meat and he talks about how um, you know protein is just uh, amino acids and lipids and all these things and it's not exclusive to animals and I think that's a big misconception is that these right. nutrients kind of only live in animals and it's just not true and and if we can do it better, easier, faster, and more humane with plants, um, I, have, I have no doubt that's the future. And, and you've seen a lot of changes. You and I, being long-term vegans, you've seen a lot of changes over the time. But with Live Kindly and now with uh, Billion Vegans, you're uh, more uh, exposed to a lot of the people within the industry that are really making these progressive changes, that are making changes on large scale, that are reaching mainstream consumers. Yeah, uh, that's exciting. I mean, <laughs> you're seeing real trend lines. You're seeing the real businesses make these decisions, even on a grand scale. The tops, you know, uh, food businesses in the world are making some of these changes. What are some of the interviews that you've had that really inspire you and give you hope for the continued progress of some of these changes? Oh, gosh. Um... I, I recently interviewed Kevin Smith, the filmmaker. Oh yes! And um, his story is is really fascinating. I mean, you know, he Dropped was somebody. <laughs> he's like a half the you know a half the person, twice the man. I think is something he's maybe said um, that he was because yeah, he he dropped um, you know a ton of weight and um, uh, is now off most of his medications. Essentially, reversed his heart disease. Um, by going plant-based. He had a major coronary event in 2018 and his uh, vegan daughter convinced him uh, to give it a try. And uh, I've heard this happen a lot, but uh, it, it, it's happened to him too, is that he kind of went vegan for his health. And then after kind of, you know, cleaned out a little bit of, of the toxins that were in his body, he had a real like emotional um uh, transition or transformation and felt like uh, he couldn't, you know, he didn't want the animal products anymore. He didn't want to be involved in the, in the slaughter or the suffering. And uh, so maybe he went vegan for his health. He stayed vegan for the animals. And uh, that was a really great, great interview. Um, I also interviewed uh, recently Damian Mander who runs the, um, Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss, uh, misname it. What is the his anti anti poaching unit in uh, Afri in uh, Africa? Oh yeah, the twerking with the uh, all female unit in Africa. Yeah, that's the Akashinga, yeah. and I apologize, Mr. Mander, if I uh, forget the name. Anti po Interna international anti poaching uh, foundation, I think, is what it is. I FP, and uh, his story is really fascinating. I mean, he was a Australian Navy sniper and um, did like, I think three tours in the Middle East and um, like a lot of our uh, veterans um, kind of left the military very, um, very lost and very confused and, and went down some paths that were um, very harmful, you know, um, drug and alcohol abuse. And, and he was looking, um, for something to kind of like save him. And he ended up in Africa um, trying to take down poachers and, and working with the people already on the ground doing that work. And, um, and then, you know, started his own, uh, his own foundation uh, has now uh, employed um, dozens of women because the women have a, a better success in helping the communities kind of understand the value of protecting rather than exploiting the animals there. Mm -hmm. uh, and he also had a, an, uh, you know, that like a, a moment, an aha moment where he was out there in the, in the savannas and the jungles, you know, working to protect these animals and coming home and putting meats on the grill. And there was just like one day where it kind of clicked for him that he can't save one animal. Uh, and exploit another, and so that um, that turned him vegan, and and he's since become a you know really outspoken uh, advocate for for uh, for all animals, and he's he's it's very and, uh, game changers as well, right? Yeah, you know, um, we went to see Game Changers here in LA when it came to the theater. I think it was like one night only, and 
I was really excited and uh, the whole audience was. And I mean, the whole movie is very interesting, um, but his scene, you know, he only has one, like one scene, like a lot of the, some of the others can come back uh, throughout the film. And his was the only one that got like cheers and applause and like hoots. And uh, he just really, really moved, moved the audience uh, with his story. We've been, uh, uh, we signed up to uh, donate every, uh, pro, uh, proceeds, uh, a portion of our proceeds to every single transaction through, it comes through our website to uh, Elephant Aid International. So um, yeah, dear to my heart, uh, what he's doing. And um, uh, they're such amazing creatures. If you've ever been next to them up close, I've been fortunate enough to, to do that, unfortunately, in captivity. But, um, incredible animals, so gentle, so wise. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you've seen the video of the animal painting that does paintings. It's yeah. just brilliant. I mean, um, gosh, to, to think that we would destroy those living beings is just amazing. So yeah, so let's talk about uh, Billion Vegans and uh, now the new project, because uh, we actually just got uh, uh, into Billion Vegans. So we just made an announcement that we're available at Billion Vegans, Clean Machine, it's all our products. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so tell, tell us about that, how that got started and what you're doing there. Yeah, um, I think it started like two years ago. Um, uh, and I became involved um, just to, like in the last six weeks um, uh, in order to kind of help uh, help grow the content side. Um, and one of the things that we'll be doing is um, is really spotlighting the the brands and the people behind the brands. Um, feel like the the stories there are uh, in a lot of ways even more valuable than the product. And uh, you know, as a storyteller by trade. Um, I love the idea of getting to know the people behind the brand. And that's something like you can't get, or at least not right now on Amazon uh, or some of these other big platforms. And, and I think the goal there, uh, Alan's goal um, is, is, is really to build a community and not, um, uh, and not lose sight of that because it's so important to, um, to this movement is, you know, who are the people and, what are they doing and what's their motivation? And, uh, you know, we have a mix of products that are uh, mainstream available, you know, like the Beyond Burger, but then we have, you know, smaller brands that you may not have heard of. Um, and we want to really give a, a spotlight to all of those and help elevate them um, uh, to a mainstream audience and, and grow. And, and I think it's, it's really achievable. The response has been fantastic. The audience is so engaged and so supportive and, and so eager to support these brands and to support the platform. So that's like incredibly inspiring. That, that's great. And yeah, so true that so many um, of the retail space is just focused on product and price. Uh, whereas there is a story behind this and that's people and the passion that they're driving behind the products that they present. And I think once you understand where brand owners and, and the people behind the products are coming from, uh, goods and services, this can make a big difference for a lot of people in why they purchase. And I love seeing that alignment style purchasing and alignment style marketing where people feel truly connected and aligned with the people and the passion behind the products, not just the product itself. Yeah, I, I thank you for saying that. I do too. I think, um, you know, we're moving to, toward a world where vegan is going to be ubiquitous. It's going to be, you know, uh, alongside the non-vegan options everywhere, or it is going to be the only vegan option. Like I know um, IKEA in Japan just replaced, uh, it had like a non-vegan curry on its menu, and it just replaced that with a fully vegan curry. So it's only katsu curry option is now vegan and i think we're going to see such a big pivot into um it being everywhere that you know those stories are, are not really going to be stories anymore but it's going to be okay who's the person that at ikea that came up with this idea or who's the the company or the people producing the you know the cutlet that's going in that curry and what was their story and i 
and I think those are um, the important the important things to talk about and the important stories to tell as we move forward. And um, you know, the product announcements are you know a footnote. It's like, yeah, you're going to be able to find it everywhere. So let's not focus on that, but let's focus on where it came from. And you know, how did you start your company, and what was your inspiration, and uh, or what's your motivation to um, when you launch a new product? And I think uh, you know everybody has those stories to tell. And I think that's not, uh, I want to like kind of footnote, that's not exclusive to the vegan movement. I think that's the way the world is shifting. And I think the pandemic has really spotlighted that, that, you know, how important uh, connection is, how important it is that we work together, these social justice issues that have been uh, plaguing our country this last six months and, and the feeling like you know, people risk their lives to get into the streets to speak out against the, the murder of an unarmed black man or a woman, you know, killed in her bed in the middle of the night by police. And they risk their lives during a pandemic to go and have these conversations. And I think because we are realizing that we need to, um, to know each other better and that we can't do this alone, we are part of a, of a bigger story. And so the more that we're able to spotlight those and tell those stories and, and elevate each other, I, I think um, I think the better off we're gonna be and the better off the, the planet's gonna be. I do, and I think uh, supporting, I, I know that like I've been vegan for uh, over 35 years now. So, um, and I know there's a lot of, uh, like I read one statistic that said 80% of the vegans uh, alive today have become vegan in the last two years. So that's a huge <laughs> bubble wow. of growth of vegans. Wow. Um, uh, so, you know, when I know I became vegan in the very first, that that passion just wanted to explode, wanted to tell everybody about it because something that so empowers and changes your life for the positive in so many different ways, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, health-wise, environment-wise, animal-wise, compassion-wise, there's so much good there. You just really feel a need to share it. But you also have this back end story of for a lot of people, myself included, oh my God, for you know, the first 18, 20 years of my life, I killed animals. And I, I participated in our horrific system that was brutal and destructive. And there's a sense of guilt there, a sense of shame that can go along with it. I think that fuels that zealotry a little bit, but it's with so many new vegans in that crux point of changing from uh, a standard American lifestyle and diet to a, a, a plant-based diet, it can, it can set up a, an emotional storm happening. And for a lot of people dealing with that process, it comes across as pushy or arrogant or self-righteous. And I'm like wondering how we as uh, more longer term uh, vegans or vegans that can find it within themselves to center and try to applaud everybody for every step of the path along the way instead of just making this about right or wrong and us versus them and making it more like I love hearing the stories about the companies that are reaching out to dairy companies who, who are collapsing because the the, the downward turn in, in demand for dairy and reaching out to them and helping them make the transition to a plant-based uh, production, actually investing in them and helping them support so they can transition to this, helping the farmers, the families, the workers that are involved in these industries that are collapsing. I love that. Now, to me, that's the extension of compassion I so admire about being vegan. And I'd love to see more of that. What are your thoughts on that? I totally agree. I, I think it's, um, uh, you know, I think there are just different different people in the world. And, and there are some people I think who are, you know, still very angry and still very shocked. And when that, you know, when that awareness happens and, you know, you hear it, like you said, you've been vegan 35 years and, uh, I'm not. I'm not that much. Uh, I'm not that far behind you. And so it's been, you know, most of my life. And to hear, um, you know, or see people. I've seen people weeping. You know, watching factory farm footage. And um, there's a tremendous amount of guilt that comes with that. 
And I think a lot of times the knee jerk reaction is, you know, an abol abolitionist kind of approach, like, um, and they don't want to support some of these big brands um, or even small brands that are, you know, step by step. But I, I think uh, when you, again, like kind of dive deeper into the stories, you see that um, a lot of these animal farmers are kind of contracted in there's not an easy escape and that is a, a big problem with industrial agriculture is um you know these big farm operations will fund these small producers to uh you know raise hens or raise broiler chickens and um they can't get out they can't get out they're they're in debt up to their eyeballs um you know and so i, I think there are countless examples of that and um, you know, give people the benefit of the doubt, and is something you know that I, I I do personally. But I think it's really hard for a lot of people. But I think it's going to be easier than ever, as you see. You know, like uh, you were talking about dairy, like a brand like Elmhurst, who I think um, I think the the founder he's in his eighties now, and he went vegan. You know, he had a kind of personal moment and his dairy business was in the dirt and, and nobody was buying his product anymore. And to make a shift that, uh, to make a shift that, that late, um, sorry, that's my daughter. <laughs> um, to make a shift that late in, in your career, um, uh, I, I think is remarkable and, you know, I don't know that people are inherently evil and out there. I mean, you know, you get some trolls on Facebook, you know, I love meat or whatever. <laughs> but I think even these big corporations are populated by people who want to do better. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a bigger problem to solve. Like, you know, there was, I think a lot of questions like, well, why doesn't McDonald's or Burger King just go like all vegan if they, you know, Burger King has the impossible Whopper and, in Europe, there's the McVegan sandwich, and uh, why aren't they just kind of flipping the switch? And you know, the reality is, it takes a lot longer to change supply chains, to you know, develop menu items, to you know, transition a farm from cows to corn or whatever. These things take you know years, if not decades. And so I think, um, yeah, we we. We owe it to ourselves to be gentle um, in this and and uh, and respectful of these processes, um, because it, you know everybody's working on their own kind of their own time, you know their own timeline, and it, it's not going to happen overnight. But I personally, like, I love what you're saying, and I, I think it's great. You know, when I hear stories like that, like Elmhurst, and there's I know like an oat milk delivery company that was um i think it's in the in the eu and it was um a dairy farm before and there's a great story of a uh that was a, a bafta winning film about a, a farmer who gave his cows to a sanctuary and like i think wow. these these stories do happen and uh and you never know who's going to happen to next so you know um come at it with uh with kindness and compassion i think is always the, the best way yeah. Well, that's uh, that's an awesome place to uh, to end the conversation. Um, but um, yeah, how can people follow uh, the work you're doing uh, on Billion Vegans? Maybe social media and get connected with you. Yeah. Um, so you can check out Billion Vegans on all your social platforms and billionvegans.com. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me uh, here on Facebook. I've got some other projects in the work that I'll be able to talk about soon. And um, yeah, I'll see you guys in the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I look forward to hearing what you have to say, because I know that they sound like some pretty uh, nice projects that you've got working on. Maybe we're going to have you back on and uh, talk about those when you're ready to share. That'd be great. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's such a pleasure to see you again, Jill. Um, yeah, thank I, you. I know we're in strange times where most of the trade shows have ended, where we used to run into each other yeah. at Natural Products Expo and stuff like that. But uh, but uh, hopefully we'll see you again. And if not, there's always social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. We'll see uh, if those expos uh, return in the next year or two. They've moved everything online, so we'll see you yes. there. Yeah. yeah. 
but there are things like uh, we, we hope to do the uh, natural, uh, the first, uh, the vegan, 100% vegan bodybuilding championship. Um, oh, I think we have someone who's going to say hi. Stand off. You want to say hi for a second? Say hi. No? <laughs> Do you want to wave? <laughs> All right, she's not feeling chatty. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> But well, thanks again, Jill. Thanks for all that you're doing and what you're doing in the movement to support this uh, through your journalism. And um, and uh, I look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.